Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Guest today with us, Michael Elsner, music licensing guru, all around <laughs> artist. Uh, yeah. Your your history is quite long. Let's get right into it. Welcome yeah, to the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You've done many things. You're not originally a Nashville boy. You no. s- started out in New York, Woodstock, yep, New York. Woodstock, New York. And yeah. then you went to LA for a while. I came here first. Oh, you came to Nashville came first. Came here first yeah. for, for about four and a half years. Yeah. And, uh, and then I went out to Los Angeles in the early 2000s. So I came here in 98. I went out to L.A. in in 2003, and then I was in L.A. for, uh, you know, about about eight and a half years, and then I came back to Nashville. Started out as a singer-songwriter, as a playing musician. What what was your your dream, your aspiration at that point? Uh, Well, always a guitar player, first and foremost, and then, you know, when I was back in New York through the 90s, I I played in bands up there and uh, had one particular band that we did a bunch of records, and and, uh, we were together for a while. And then once that ended, I moved to Nashville and I came to Nashville really just looking to build a career as a guitar player. Ideally, my goal at that time, you know, I was in my early 20s was to go out and tour and just get a road gig. But because, you know, Woodstock has a pretty thriving uh, uh, studio scene, I had been used to hanging out in studios since I was a teenager. So when I came to Nashville, I didn't know anyone. So I just started hanging out in studios and I was comfortable with that. So I, I could walk into the studio. I could walk right past the front uh, desk person, which was always an intern who had no idea who was coming and going. And if you look like you know what you're doing, then it's that much exactly. easier. Exactly. Yeah. I just walk right on by him and say hello. And, and, uh, and that was just the game that I played because I didn't know what else to do. I just came into town. I didn't know one person. So I started hanging out in studios. And right when I came to town, I was going into some studios down in you know Franklin and Cool Springs. I met some people right off the bat within the you know literally within the first day of being in town and so I just started hanging out in studios and then that led to I started off assisting a couple guys you know I'd take home the the uh, the manual for the SSL console over the weekend and read it and learn how this console worked and and then that ultimately led to I, I became friends with people, so I'd, I'd work out free time like in, in, in the studio. So I'd be able to do my, my own uh, demos and stuff like that on the weekends and whatnot. And this is, of course, back in, in the ADAT days. So Pro Tools, having Pro Tools at your house wasn't a common you know situation. And then that ultimately led to me getting hired to produce some artists and do their demos. And I did that for a number of years. And all the while, I was just trying to write songs and you know get a publishing deal and find a gig playing for, for an artist. And after four years of having every label, every uh, publisher, in Nashville tell me no, which makes sense because I wasn't writing country songs at the time. I went out to Los Angeles and within my first month of being in Los Angeles, I got a gig playing guitar on a TV show. And then that opened up my world to writing for TV and specifically the world of, of licensing music. And so within the first year of living in LA, I had my entire catalog of songs that I'd written over the previous four and a half years in Nashville placed on all these TV shows and a couple films. You make it sound extremely easy it was not <laughs> <laughs> how did it come about i mean it, in a very s- simple layman's term if i created a song and wanted to get it out there yeah. it, it isn't that easy it isn't that simple you've got to really you've got to know some people it's relationships yeah it's you definitely have to know the process i don't necessarily think you have to know the people uh you have to know the process and it starts by simply understanding and one of this is one of the mistakes that i see a lot of musicians make when it comes to the sync licensing world is that they finish their song and they approach the delivery aspect the exact same way that they would approach it if they were in the music industry, meaning that they would take their full version of the song, which is their final mix, and they send it out. And they hope that someone listens to it and does something with it. And the reality is that when you're licensing your music, you're not 
working in the music industry, you're working in the TV industry, you're in the commercial industry, the film industry, or even in the video game industry. And those end users in those industries who use music, they need music delivered to them in a completely different way, right? So for example, this is as simple as it gets. Most musicians will think, I need to deliver a full resolution file, right? Not an MP3. That's what they hear, you know, I can't send an MP3. So what do they do? They send a WAV file, right? But the reality is that a WAV file can't even, doesn't even contain metadata. Aside from the artist and the, and the, and the title of the song, WAV files don't, carry any metadata right so if i'm an editor you have to put yourself now in, in the position of, of your end users right if i'm an editor working on a tv show like flip or flop right and you just sent me a cool rock track or pop track that's that would be great for a bunch of people you know hammering some nails and stuff like that if i'm looking for for music that would fit that scene right i have a scene in front of me that's a 20 second scene and and your song would be perfect for me how would i find that song if the the file you sent doesn't have any metadata attached to it, because you got to keep in mind the editors are looking through these vast catalogs of songs and they're typing in keywords, right? So if your song is upbeat and rocking and and great for like you know construction and stuff like that, those might be keywords that you would attach to that song to that actual audio file. But if you attach it to a WAV file, it won't show up when you send it to me. That's why when you deliver an audio file, you should always deliver an AIFF file. Because AIFF files like MP3s contain metadata. WAV files do not. And this is something that anyone can, who's listening can practice at home. You can take a WAV file on your iTunes. You can fill it out with all this metadata. Pull it all out of your iTunes to your desktop. Then delete it from your iTunes. Then slide it back into iTunes and see what happens. All that metadata that you attach to that WAV file will be gone. Nothing will show up aside from the title and the artist. For lack of a better term, there's so much content out there. There's so much music out there. Right. And and what you said, the, the libraries are full of this of this music they're yeah. looking for. And a lot of times, it's not full songs anyway. It's just snippets here and there. And they're wanting something to help emphasize that scene. Yes. And they want to really be able to find it at the drop of a hat so to speak absolutely because they don't have a lot of time to do a lot of research not at all yeah no. i did an interview uh some months back with honeymoon suite who did the closing theme song for uh, the hit movie lethal weapon oh cool and they didn't even know the song until after the film was done uh -huh. and they didn't have a chance to to see the film or how it was where it was going to be placed sure. or how it was going to be laid into they just went in the studio and cut the track yeah. And in fact, it was so late into the process, they wound up not getting film credit. You know, the rolling credits oh, at the yeah, end of the yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. It's just, the, and, and of yeah. course it went on to be a big hit song. Yeah. Yeah. But that's how quick some of these things turn around. The the deadlines in the licensing world are, are very real. And I always think it's very interesting when, you know, I, I meet a, a songwriter in town, obviously living in Nashville now. I've, I've moved back to Nashville in the last number of years. But, you know, when I meet, meet a songwriter here in town who's like, oh, yeah, I just, you know, last week I got a, a, a you know, a, 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 a request from a supervisor. And so my buddy and I were writing the song and we're producing right now. And I think, yeah, you got that request on like Thursday at 11 a.m. And they needed it by 5 p.m. They're not waiting a week for you to, you know just deliver some, you know, write a song and hopefully deliver it to them because that film or that show or whatever it went, that went to the re-recording mixer over the weekend and he had it finalized and sent out by Monday. So if you're still writing the song, <laughs> you know, into the week, you've completely missed the boat on it because unlike in the music industry where, you know, you find out someone like Blake Shelton is looking for songs, yeah, you might have a couple weeks to write, you know, the some songs to potentially pitch for his album. In the licensing world, it's not even close to the case. You have hours. Hours instead of days or hours. weeks. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, and, and the other thing, too, is, you know, right now it's very popular. One of the popular phrases is, you know, music supervisors. Everyone throws out music supervisor. Oh, we're just going to get our songs to these music supervisors. I, I hear that all the time. And that's wonderful. Uh, and, I, and I applaud, applaud them for, for, you know, for taking the, uh, the initiative. Right. But the reality is that if you are not confident reading understanding and negotiating a licensing contract literally in a matter of hours, then the deal's going to fall off the table. This isn't a situation where you're going to have, you know, a week to call up your attorney and, and give them the contract and have them read through it. it and, and literally, hope your attorney's going to call you back. Yes. Yeah. 
So another thing that, you know, while I do work with supervisors and I do work with editors directly, another thing that I'm a big advocate for for musicians is to work with a reputable third party licensing agency. Now, the term that gets thrown around for these is library, a library, you know, music library, music library, you know, it can sometimes have a negative connotation to it. But music libraries can be many things, just like nowadays a music producer can be many things. A music producer could be the guy who's overseeing the entire project, or the music producer could be the guy writing everything, recording it, and mixing it, right? So it's a library is kind of the same term, right? So you really have to look into the different library that you're working with to see what kind of role they're going to play. But uh, I'm a big advocate for musicians who are not confident in you know, reading and, and negotiating and understanding everything that goes into a, a licensing contract. I'm a big advocate of them working with a third party that can do that for them. And, and, and just to draw a parallel to that, that'd be like working with a real estate agent selling your house. You can always sell your house on your own, but a real estate agent will probably be able to do it more effectively, efficiently, and probably even get you more money for it. And help you avoid the perils and pitfalls. Exactly. How do you go about finding these people? What's the best way to do it? And, and we're going to get into it because you actually have a program yeah. that discusses this. It's um, uh, Master Music Licensing. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that in the, in the next segment. But you need to find these people, and but you need to find the right one. Absolutely. And it's... Are there different people for different fits? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, one of the very first things that I tell anyone who wants to learn how to license their songs is to, one thing I always find very interesting is when musicians are, are kind of boasting about the fact that I never watch TV. Oh, you know, I never watch TV, right? Well, and then that's kind of the equivalent of saying, like, I want to write a, a number one country song, but I never listen to country radio. Right. <laughs> How do you know what's current in country radio if you're not listening to country radio, right? If you want to be a write, write a top 40 hit, you need to listen to top 40 radio. Well, it's the same thing with TV. If you want to write music that's ideal for TV, then you need to start by listening to TV. And it's specifically listening to TV. So one of the very first things that I tell anyone who's interested in going down this, this route with their music is to stop watching TV You know, in the evening instead of sitting there watching it and focusing on it, just let it go, lay on your sofa, keep your eyes closed, and just listen. And when it comes time for a commercial, don't get up and go to the kitchen and make yourself some food. Lay there through the commercial and listen because you will find from the time you lay down, if you give yourself an hour from, from second one to you know the end of 60 minutes, you'll find that music is nonstop. There's music through every single commercial. There's music through every single show. And there's an unbelievable variety of music. So for example, if you're watching a show, you might be watching a specific type of show and the sound and the overall feel of that show might be might be country music, like a show like Nashville, right? But you could be watching another show where it would be based around like hip hop, you know, or, or R&B. You could be watching another show. I used the flip or flop example earlier. If you ever watch a show like, you know, where they're doing house building stuff, home flipping stuff, you know, that's always upbeat driving tracks, you know, energized tracks. So if you're doing like some, some upbeat rock music, that would be an ideal outlet for that. So depending on the style of music that you write, that's going to determine what shows are going to use your music. I believe there was a show called Empire that used a lot of like R&B, right, and, and whatnot. Well, if you're a country writer, the person who's supervising that show or the music editor for that show would not be your ideal client, <laughs> right? And the same is true for like, like a rap or hip hop artist. You know, if, if they wanted to get their music on TV, looking at the, the supervisors for the show Nashville would not be an ideal outlet for them. Right. Because so you have to, to have an understanding of, of where your music fits in. And it's the same thing being a songwriter. You know, if you're writing tracks, you know, and you know, hey, this track is great for Blake Shelton. Then, you know, that you're going to start reaching out to maybe some country artists. You're not going to reach out to like Elton John. Well, he, he writes his own music anyway. You know what I'm saying? So as a musician, you have to do the research and you have to understand where your music fits in to start with. And no matter which path you're going down, that does require research and an understanding of those outlets. We're going to take a break, get a word in for our sponsors here. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about mastermusiclicensing.com, which is a program you've created sure. for this yeah. and can help these songwriters out there and get their music placed into such films. I was looking at some of the placements you've done. The trailer for Disney, Cinderella, Ocean's 8, Jack Ryan, Sneaky Pete, Narcos, Better Call Saul. 
there's opportunities out there. And there is an un, we can go over the numbers when we come back from the, yeah. from the break. Cause I actually do know the numbers on the opportunities for licensing and, and the outlets available. Cool. We're going to talk about that. Michael Elsner's in the studio with us. Hey everyone. This is Jack Sharkey. I'm the marketing and technical communications manager at Kef and you're listening to the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler and I approve of this message. Thanks. Wow, I just joined the Music Starts Here community. This is a truly hidden gem for anyone in the music business. Whether you live in Nashville or anywhere else in the world, Music Starts Here is like a GPS for your music career. This is the place to be if you want to get advice and direction from some seriously talented musical people who have been where you want to go. Music news, events, and a great big community with resources for artists, songwriters, musicians, studio and tech, along with music business advice from pros in the industry, all on one site. Make sure you get your free profile now. Go to www.musicstartshere.org. That's musicstartshere.org. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Michael Elsner, talking about getting your music into film, television, video games. There's a whole huge world out there of song placement, music placement yeah. that goes beyond radio, that goes beyond getting your music on, as you said, Blake Shelton CD. This is an opportunity that I know a lot of artists want to get into that don't necessarily understand it. So you've created mastermusiclicensing.com for this purpose, right? Yeah. To teach people how to get their music placed. And the numbers are pretty staggering yeah it's you know it's interesting i mean the yeah the, we can go over some of the numbers if you'd like yeah let's okay, do so, absolutely so these are the numbers that i know off the top of my head for this last year just in the last 10 years alone the amount of scripted tv shows has increased 174 percent that's just the scripted shows that's not including like films or documentaries or commercials or corporate promos you know or even the world of video games which is massive in fact uh, last year was uh, in the UK video game sales overtook both uh, sales of music and video that was the first time in history that video games actually you know really trumped any of those and it's they're catching up pretty quickly here in America as well so the video game market is, is massive also but when it comes to just the amount of scripted shows, there's over 500 scripted shows currently in production. Last, last year, there are 498, but now there's over 500. Because it goes beyond just the four major networks. Oh, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. You just look at what's happened with like Netflix and, and Hulu and Amazon Prime in the last couple of years with the amount of uh, programs that, they've, that they're creating. I mean, just dozens and dozens and dozens of, of series, but then also films and whatnot. And all of them need music. You know, it's not uncommon for, say, an, an hour's worth of a television show. I get cue sheets all the time, so I always look through and see, you know, how many songs are in them. But for an hour's television program, it's, it's not uncommon for there to be uh, 80 to 120 tracks of music, different tracks of music. Yeah. And, and when you talk about tracks of music, the length of duration can be anywhere from just a few seconds yeah. to... Two or three minutes. Yeah. 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 Rarely do you have an actual full length. Say so you have a three and a half minute song. Rarely will you have a show play that full length of, of a track but the longest i've personally ever had placed was like two minutes and like 23 seconds of a song which was you know a pretty pretty good amount of time that's two minutes and 23 seconds of a an hour-long program which is really like you know 40 
40, uh, I think 40, it's like 43 or 44, 44 minutes, minutes, yeah, yeah. something like that. So that's a, that's a pretty significant portion of that show. When you get a song placed on a show like that, and obviously there's licensing involved for that yeah. song, that's partly, that's really how you get paid. Yeah, so you have, anytime a song gets licensed, anytime you, you know, you do the exercise that we talked about in the, in the last segment where you just listen to music, every time you hear a song on a TV show or program or a, or a commercial or anything like that, there are two licenses that have to be signed for that. One is the sync license. Which is the one most commonly known. People call both of these licenses as a whole sync licensing. Right. And so they're kind of grouped into that term. But within the term sync licensing is really there are really two licenses. You have a sync license and the sync license is uh, signed and negotiated by whoever controls the copyright. And that's generally the publisher. OK. And then you have the master license and that's whoever owns the recording. So, for example, a good example of this would be something like this. OK. So, for example, uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door was written by Bob Dylan. But it was been covered by many different artists, okay? So back in the day, you know, Guns N' Roses did their version of it. And let's say that a show wants to license Guns N' Roses' version of Knocking on Heaven's Door. So now the music supervisor, this is their job, they have to go and they have to secure the license. So that music supervisor would contact Guns N' Roses' record label, which at the, is Geffen Records. Geffen paid for the recording, so they own that specific master recording. Okay. They would negotiate that master license. At the same time, the supervisor would then have to reach out to Bob Dylan's publishing company, right? Because Bob Dylan's a songwriter. So Bob Dylan's publishing company controls the copyright. So they're the ones who would negotiate and sign the sync license. Okay. So both of those licenses have to be signed for both the intellectual property, which is the song, that's the sync portion, and then that specific recording, and that's the master portion. Now, people generally group this into one term called sync licensing, but they're really two different licenses that have to be signed. And one of the benefits of being an independent artist is that you generally own both the master and the sync. Right. So you are what's called a one-stop shop. For example, licensing a track for me, let's say I wrote a song, let's say you and I wrote a song right now, okay? And I sent it out to a supervisor because we had to have it in by like five o'clock. And let's say at 5.30, they love it and they want to license that track. Well, we can take care of that in one simple email, right? Because we don't have to, you and I don't have to deal with any third party companies. We don't have to deal with a record label or a publisher or anything like that, right? We can handle both of this very quickly in literally a minute or two, you know, sign the documents, scan them and send them back. That's also one of the benefits as an, as an independent artist of working with like a third party uh, company, aka a library, is because the libraries are also called one-stop shops. They have already secured the rights to administer the master and the sync license. And that's why they've gained a lot of popularity in the last number of years among supervisors, because now supervisors can go to a library and secure the license on any type of pop song. You know, back in the day when people thought of libraries, they were just, you know, uh, catalogs of instrumental music. But now libraries ha are catalogs of a lot of independent artist music, lots of vocal songs across lots of different styles. So a supervisor can reach out to them. They can secure that license literally in just a matter of minutes. I want to jump on that for a second, too. Is there more demand for instrumentals? or vocals or is it a mix of both if you and i are going to write a song yeah. for something do we focus on something that's got lyrical content or are we looking for this just impactful you know from an instrumentation that's standpoint? a fantastic question and the answer is yes as a whole this is what i've learned you know everyone has their own process okay and and i've been doing this really since 2004 and so as I've been doing this and, and building up my own career doing this, I've kind of formulated a little process, right? And my process just works great for me. And the second step in my process is what I call creating valuable content. So if you and I get together and write a song, we can write anything. We could write a vocal song. We could write an instrumental song. It doesn't matter. In the second, let's say we write a vocal song, all right? In the second step of my process, I'm going to create all these instrumental mixes and I'm also going to create all these alternate mixes. So that's why I call it creating valuable content. Again, we got to think of the end users. The end users are going to be editors. They're also going to be directors. They're going to be producers. They already have the vision and the, and, and the story all laid out. They even have a vision in their head of what they want the music to be. It's just a matter of your, your role is to, is to deliver music in a way that allows them to utilize it. So for example, let's say you 
you and I write a song, we're going to have a full version of it. That's going to be the vocals, the full band, everything. But then I'm also going to obviously create an instrumental track. But then I'm also going to go into it. I'm going to see what else I can pull out of it. Let's say we started the song with just acoustic guitar and vocals. Well, I can strip out all everything. I can strip out the drums, the bass, you know, the, the crazy guitars and, and keyboards and orchestra and all that and strip it down to just the vocals and the acoustic guitar. I could also take out a lot of other instruments and maybe just have, you know, drums, a uh, simple guitar line, maybe acoustic guitar, piano, and, and vocals, and we can call that the stripped down version. An editor would be able to use all of those and crossfade between them if necessary. Let's say there's a section in a scene where dialogue is going to get in the way. They can use the instrumental section until that dialogue ends and then crossfade right into the full version. Or they could do the same thing with an acoustic version. And you hear this. This is part of that first example that I, I gave you. When you start li listening to TV, you start hearing this all over the place. There might be, during the dialogue, the acoustic version or the stripped down version. But then right at that poignant moment where, you know, the girl gets mad at the guy and walks out and slams the door, right? At that s door slam, that's when that crossfade happens to that full version chorus. And you think, my gosh, how, how did someone write this? This is brilliant. Well, it's because they delivered music the proper way to their end users. They got they got out of the music industry mindset and they started focusing in on the end users who are in the TV industry, the film industry, commercial industry, and whatnot. One of the things we talk a lot about on the show is the music business has changed so dramatically over the last oh, yeah. 10, 15, 20 years. You know, it's all streaming now. It's not even really downloads. And, yeah. and fortunately, the vinyl business is, you know, resurrected itself and has yeah. come back. But film and television has always kind of, I, I don't know if I want to say that status quo, but they've always relied on music beds of sorts. Yeah, and of that's, none of that has changed. In fact, as you've said, it's the demand has actually increased uh, substantially because now you are hearing music on commercials. Oh, I yeah. notice if you watch any of like these fixer upper shows, like you said, flipper flopper, the DIY, you yeah. know, the, the landscape <laughs> nightmare shows, where yep. there's still those music beds in there. Do you try to write for some specific style or do you just try and cover everything what's really the best oh, route a, because one of the things you have in your program is mm -hmm. is build that catalog yeah that's your first that's step a, yeah and again this this comes down to my particular approach to this step one of my process is to build your catalog and what i mean by that is is just write the music that you're passionate about writing when you write the music that you're passionate about writing that's going to come across when it's synced to picture even more right when you actually have passion in it i have done it in the past where i've chased after something oh this is what they need so i'm going to write it you know and to me personally, that's not an enjoyable experience. And I have, I have some other friends who are incredibly successful in this world and they love it. They love that challenge. That's just never been my thing. So while I have gone down that road, I found that I've actually been more successful when I just write the music that I want to write. So if I come into my studio and I want to write a heavy metal track one day, there's going to be an outlet for it in what I call those military metal shows, which is, you know, uh, you know, where they're like the military shows, you know, and, and uh, even, even some of those fixer upper shows where, you know, they have the more aggressive stuff. But then you could also come in and you could write orchestral pieces, you could write acapella pieces. There's always going to be an outlet for it. That's been my approach. If you continuously build your catalog, because it's never about one placement, you know, it's about getting consistent placements. You're going to build your career on consistent placements. No artist builds their career on one song, right? Big artists who have longevity, they build their career on a catalog of songs. And this is the exact same thing. While I think that it's important to pay attention to music and understand like what's going on sonically on the different shows that you're watching, personally, I don't feel like, okay, I just watched Flip or Flop, so I'm going to go into my studio and I'm just going to write for the next days all these tracks that I think could be on Flip or Flop. I understand if I'm starting to go down that road, okay, this track that I'm writing is, is definitely more aggressive. It's guitar oriented. Okay, well... Okay, so I've been watching Flipper Flop lately, and I know that this would be a great outlet for it. And so I know that when I'm getting ready to finish up that song and get it out, I know that I'm going to look for the outlet that would be the HGTV DIY network. But if at the same time, let's say, you know, you came in and, and it's the middle of summer and you just wanted to write a Christmas song. You know, you're sick of the fact that it's 100 degrees outside. You want to write a Christmas song. Let's face it. Hallmark Channel or Lifetime Channel is just inundated that's, with Christmas songs. That's exactly right where now. I was going. Well, this is great. Let's write a Christmas song. And the second it's done, I know that I'm going to get on IMDb and I'm going to look for the supervisor. Uh, well, first I'm going to get on Hallmark and I'm going to research a bunch of their, you know, uh, Christmas shows from last year. I'm going to write them down. Then I'm going to get on IMDb and I'm going to look them up and I'm going to write down who the supervisors were for those. And that's who I'm going to contact. 
because now I have a Christmas song that might be ready for their Christmas shows coming up this next year. So the idea is to write the music you're passionate about writing, and then the outlets will present themselves. But it does require research, you know, like anything. The quality of the music you're recording needs to be the best. Absolutely, yeah. It's gonna be heard by millions and millions of people worldwide. And there's no time or really an additional budget to go in and re-record it, unless that's something they ask for. And that's, I guess, rare, if it's hardly rare. ever at all. Yeah, pretty rare. You know, one of the things that I always do is I always make sure I deliver the stems. That way the re-recording mixer or the music editor can, you know, we, we mix things in stereo, but a lot of TV shows and films are mixed in 5.1, 7.1. So again, this comes back to down to the whole delivery aspect. If you deliver stems, this allows the re-recording mixer, who is the last person in line. Uh, there's about three or four more people in the TV world that are going to play with and edit your music before it gets to the final you know, mix. But the re-recording mixer then has that ability to take those stems and throw them around in that 5.1 or 7.1 surround space and not just be stuck with a stereo uh, version of your track. Again, this just comes down to understanding that you're now delivering music for people who work in a completely different industry and they utilize music in a completely different way. We're going to take another break, get a, another word in for a couple of our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to continue this discussion of getting your music into film, television, and video games. Uh, Michael Elsner is our guest today. He's written a program called Master Music Licensing. Actually got the book in front of us, Master Music Licensing, which you you said you can download on Amazon. Yeah, you can you can go and you can get it on Amazon or even Walmart at seven bucks, or you can go to mastermusiclicensing.com and you can get it for free. <laughs> Good. Well, we're going to cover more of that when we come on back. This is Claire Ratliff with Laughing Penguin Publicity, and you're listening to the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, this is Vinny Rebus, the founder of Vinny Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Michael Elsner is with us today talking about, we're really, I guess, talking about all things when it comes to master music licensing. I remember some years ago, a buddy of mine, Rick Derringer, who's oh, yeah. really written some, some great songs, you know, not only Hang On Sloopy, but, huh. uh, you know, he had uh, Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo oh, yeah, and, and yeah. worked with Edgar Winter on, on Free Ride. He and I were having a conversation one day and he said, yeah, this this company called and they're a video game company i don't know a lot about them but they want to use my song rock and roll huchiku on this thing called guitar hero yeah and he goes well, what do i do yeah you know and back then we you know i was a label guy and back then we were like i don't know is there any money to be made in this and of course then he saw the offer and oh, he was yeah. like oh yeah, yeah. you know I'm, I'm doing this and that was really kind of back then the beginning of us realizing beyond film and television video games was a big thing massive and of course and of course television commercials are yeah. now too yeah. when you get your music and we were talking about getting your music into film and television and then you mentioned uh, imdb imdb.com yeah so internet movie database yeah there are a number there are a number of, of websites that are incredible resources again to do your research so you know like i said earlier i had a four step or i have a process i have a four step process and the fourth step of my process is where IMDB comes in to play. Because again, you know, you got to take the time, you got to research the shows, right? So we talked earlier, we were talking about like, just as an example, the Hallmark, you know, we write a Christmas song and, and now we're going to reach out to the people on, you know, who supervise these movies and, and, um, tell and shows on, on the Hallmark channel. Well, how do we look them up? You go to IMDB. You, you go to imdb.com and then you look up that particular movie and we'll just call it, we'll just say, for example, you know, one of the movies last year was called, you know, uh, Christmas Without You. I don't know, whatever. So we would go probably to, yeah, was. probably was, yeah. right? So we'd go to imdb.com and we'd type in A Christmas Without You. <laughs> 
And that's going to, you know, show up. Uh, it's going to bring up the film or the show, you know, we'll call it a little, you know, film. And uh, and so it'll bring up the film and, and uh, it shows all the cast members, everyone who is a part of the cast, everyone who is part of all the different um, the production crew members. And uh, and then what you can do is, is very simple. You just scroll down uh, when you call up any particular show. You scroll down a little bit. You're going to see a little heading that says full cast and crew. You just have to click on it. It's going to give you a pretty big drop down menu you keep scrolling down until you get to music department when you get to music department that's where you're going to see all the people who worked on the music the re the re-recording mixer the music editor the music coordinator the music supervisor right and then you can click on all of their names they're all linked around so you can click on you know say say you know the the music supervisor's name is you know uh, jane doe you know whatever so you're going to click on on jane doe's name and it's going to take you to jane jane doe's page on imdb.com and you can see all the shows that Jane Doe has worked on. All those on, credits. All the credits. You can uh, literally throughout her entire career and even the current shows that are in production, you'll even see things that will say like currently in production. So, oh, she's working on another. Oh, my gosh. She's working on another Christmas thing for Hallmark because it says currently in production. Well, this is perfect. Let me reach out to her and see if maybe she could use our Christmas song. So it's an incredible resource and, and you can uh, you can navigate your way through that in like literally two minutes. Are you better off being an independent artist in that type of an aspect than tied to a big publishing firm? So that's a fantastic question. And the answer is, it could be yes. It could be yes. It could be no. It could be yes if you actually know what you're doing. And if, if, you're, if you're someone who could, who could actually handle administering your catalog and signing the contracts, and you're not someone who the supervisor has to spend their time teaching you the business. They're not going to spend their time teaching you the business. And then I think the other thing, too, is they want a, a certain ease of mind that not only do you know what you're talking about, but that you own the property. Oh, I'm so glad you brought this up. So this is another reason why, again, I'm a big advocate for if you're a new artist if you're if you haven't done this before i'm a big advocate of you working with a library same thing as if you haven't sold your house before it makes a lot logical sense to work with a realtor right one of the reasons why supervisors now work with libraries a lot and people don't realize this but they do work with them a lot is because the libraries have fully vetted the music it also means that let's say you're an artist and and you just so happen to use a sample from an late 70s Van Halen song, you know, just a, a drum sample, right? And let's say you rapped over it, you know, or, or whatever. Well, if that's in a library and then the supervisor licenses that song and then that publishing company, again, for say for Van Halen, starts coming after them for, hey, you, you use a song and, you know, that's our sample. We own that. Well, who's on the hook for that? Now it's the library. Right. Right. So one of the reasons why supervisors do work with libraries a lot is because they're no longer on the hook for being sued in that case. So, yes, uh, that is definitely a benefit to working with a library. And it's one of the reasons why supervisors and editors do like working with libraries. And again, libraries, just as, as a whole, uh, is, is not that negative connotation that it had years ago. A library is just a third party administrator of your music. I want to jump to step three, which you talk about, which is master metadata. I know that's something that we should all know, yeah. but a lot of people don't. Yeah. It's much like I've had conversations with artists in the past who have written songs and recorded them. And I said, did you include your ISRC code? Yeah. And they're like, I don't know what that is. Yeah. And then, okay, get a hold of your producer. And they call me back and they go, the <laughs> yeah. producer doesn't know yeah. what it is. So we live in a digital world, right? Yeah. Everything is tracked digitally. And again, this just comes down to, again, you have to understand the licensing world is a different world than the music industry in the sense that the music that's used in a TV show is tracked via a cue sheet. Okay. Uh, every single TV show, every single episode of every single show that you see has a cue sheet. And that lists every single song, type of use, the length of it, the writers, and the, the publishers. Okay, And those cue sheets are sent to the PROs. So here in America, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. And that's how your royalties are tracked. But before we even get to the cue sheet, your song has to actually end up, I look at it like a funnel. Your song has to end up at the bottom of a funnel. There's hundreds of thousands of songs that are being searched for a particular song that would match this particular scene. And you want your song to always end up at the bottom of the funnel. Well, let's say you have the perfect song for this scene. But if you don't have your metadata attached to the audio file, how's your song going to be found? 
It won't. On top of that, your metadata also has all the relevant information, not only to, to search it, all the keywords that search it in the description of the song, but then also, uh, you know, your songwriter info, your CAE IPI number, your publishing info, the CAE IPI number, right? So that everything is tracked accordingly. And when those songs are licensed, gone are the days of someone sitting there with a pencil and writing it into a piece of paper. When that song is licensed, the a lot of times the a program that's used in this world, a platform is called Source Audio. That's what houses all that information. Well, that automatically populates these cue sheets. And again, that's pulled directly from the audio file. And if it's not there... Good luck. Yeah, next. Yeah. Exactly. So again, it's it's not just about... This is the difference between licensing and being successful in the licensing world and just being an independent artist, right? Pursuing music. If you're an independent artist, you can have a lot of success licensing your songs. If you deliver your music in a way that allows the end users in the licensing world to utilize it, to easily search it, audition it, and license it. On top of it, if you deliver your music in a way that gives them options, gives your re-recording mixer, your music editor options, adding the what I call the valuable content, the stripped down mix, the instrumental mix, you know, the stim mixes. I'll give you a great example. I have a friend of mine, girl and I, we, we co-wrote the song together, little you know, country artist, girl, independent. We did a four song EP, right? We wrote all four songs and I, I produced it for there's one song alone, the first song uh, that she released, you know, I, I put quotes around that word released, but that song, I did the math the other day, that song has been licensed 48 times, but it's been on The Voice over the last two seasons 15 times. Out of those 15 times, eight of those placements were not the full vocal mix. So here's one song that's generated almost 50 placements, and just on one very popular show that a lot of people are familiar with, more than half of those placements were an alternate mix that we delivered. That's the importance of delivering the valuable content. If you didn't do that, how many placements would we have had? I don't know, maybe three? So all those different layers that you create are all, every single one of them is very important. Absolutely, yeah. And all of those, that was just, you know, again, we're almost at 50 placements on that one song. Every single placement generates the upfront licensing fee, right? In both the sync and the master licenses. And then on the back end, when the show is aired, it generates the performance royalties. You know, it's interesting. I, I did some research recently and I was looking at streaming. People talk a lot about streaming. Right. And it's a hot button topic right now. It's a hot button now. topic. Yeah. So the minimum monthly wage, this was released in, uh, by a website called Digital Music News. And I, I, I just remembered these numbers. The, the minimum monthly wage, meaning the minimum wage in America, but the minimum monthly wage in America is $1,472. Okay? That's what they consider the minimum monthly wage. And so what this company did is they decided to look at all the platforms and see how many streams it would take to generate that many. Now, Napster was the most generous. It was 77,000 streams. Spotify was like 336,000 streams. And YouTube was 2,333,333 streams. That was an easy number to remember. So you have, everyone talks about Spotify right? There's, there's over 40 million songs right now on Spotify. And they actually say, Spotify actually says that there's over f an average of 40,000 new songs being uploaded to Spotify every day. So Spotify kind of sits right in the middle of that list between the 77,000 and the 2.1 million, right? Streams to make just under $1,500. But here's the thing about licensing. And this is the thing that I'm very uh, passionate about it, talking to musicians about it is because they get so caught up in, in streaming, which is really pennies, but you have to market your music to hundreds of thousands of people to hopefully get that $1,500. Literally, Literally hundreds, hundreds of, thousands. of thousands of people. If we just look at Spotify being the most generous, assuming that 10% of the people you market your music to listen to your track, you'd have to hit over 750,000 people. That's insane. But one song placement between the upfront sync fees, or well, upfront sync fees can, can go into the multiple five figures, but between the upfront sync fees and then the back end royalties, 1500 bucks is, is a piece of cake. I did a video recently that I released on, on, on my website where I, I talked about how I, I gave an example from actually my last royalty statement of a track that generated over $3,300 in one statement, and it was two chords. And I think, I think, why are we spending our time talking about streaming? And I always get questions of like, well, if I work with a library, can I put my songs up on streaming? My first answer is, who cares? <laughs> what are you going to lose, a buck or two? And the answer really is, of course you can, because, again, a library is not taking on the role of a record label. They're not working in the music industry. They don't care what you do with your songs if you're selling it to your fans. They're just marketing your songs for licensing opportunities. But still, the first answer is, why do you care about streaming? You're talking about a couple pennies. 
Who cares? What's more important to you to maybe potentially get it out in front of 150,000 fans yeah. or to have a really nice five figure check wind up in your no mailbox. Kidding. Yeah. No kidding. And the reality is that is that when you do work with with third party administrators, they want you promoting your music. You know, my I have a company called Sonic Trimmer. We do a lot of film trailers. My partner and I are constantly promoting our music. Now we work with a company that that reps the entire catalog for us. But we are constantly promoting the the trailer music that we do to the editors and the supervisors in the trailer world. So we're constantly marketing that music. We'll get emails or we'll get phone calls of, hey, we we just had one that came in from Disney just recently where someone was reaching out to license a track. They wanted they contacted us directly, which makes sense because we're marketing it, right? And all we did is we just sent them a simple email. We forwarded that email to to the girl at our at admin company and did a simple introduction. She handled it from there. It's very simple. Right. So as, a, as an artist, you should always be promoting your music, but getting caught up on streaming who cares. Yeah. No, I don't understand it. Let's talk about master music licensing, the program that you created. Sure. How can people find it? And what are the benefits? You can go to mastermusiclicensing.com, www.mastermusiclicensing.com. The www is important. I haven't figured out how to fix it. You know, uh, so if you don't do that, it'll take you to a blank page. <laughs> I, uh, I'm we so, don't want that. I know, I'm so, I'm so anti-tech, right? Yeah. But uh, I should probably just get someone to fix that for me. You can go there and you can get a, a book. I, I have I literally outlined my process, the four-step hand licensing success in a book. You can go there, you can get it for free, or you can go on Amazon or Walmart and you can type in the four-step plan of licensing success or master music licensing and you can pay seven bucks and they'll ship it to you. Either or, it's up to you. And then I have a program. Uh, that book did really well. I, I literally put together that book because when I moved to Nashville, I've been, I got asked about this a lot and I'd spend, and I'm a talker obviously, and I'd spend half a day meeting someone for a cup of coffee and ex- explain to them what they needed to do. And then after a while, they just started really, you know, biting into my time. So I put it together. In and a you can only book. drink so much coffee. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So I started giving the book out. And then I had a friend of mine who was really encouraging me to put together a course. And then I kind of found out that a lot of people wanted that as well. So I did. I put together a really in-depth course where it's a lot of screen capture. We go through the entire process from, from step one of my process all the way to step four, I show you how to put together, a, you know, not how to write a song. We start from the mixing process, right? Start from the mixing process, how to burn out all your valuable content, uh, how to add the metadata for vocal songs and instrumental songs. We go through every aspect of it. I have a spreadsheet that I send in with every track that's got 26 columns. It's literally about as, as exhaustive as you can get with your metadata. We go through the process of finding and researching supervisors and actually how to reach out to them. I actually give you my, my actual email script that I use, which is great. It's five sentences. You can do anything in five sentences or less, really. And then, you know, once that happens, once you get a, a contract, then what? What do you do? Well, I have a whole module where we go through five different contracts. I went through about 100 contracts to narrow it down to these five. And these five contracts cover literally everything you will ever encounter in the licensing world, both good and bad. And we break down how to read every aspect of it and how to understand it. So the idea here is that you're in complete control of the process all the way through. And then I have a lot of bonus material. I have a private mastermind group and then I do live Q and A's for those who are in the group and I bring in a lot of guests. I've had, you know, Grammy winning composers on on it, people who work at different PROs and I mean, you name it, you know, so it's very intensive. And, and ultimately if if you were to go through all the videos, every single video that's in the course right now, it'd take you about 20 hours. It's, it's, it's involved. But it's at your own pace. It's at your own pace. And, uh, you know, one of the cool things is, is seeing people who go through the course. You know, one of the guys who's in the course right now has a national commercial for Panera. Prior to that, he had uh, earlier this year, he had a national commercial for Cigna Healthcare. But a year ago, he didn't know the first thing about this. So that's the cool thing. There's another guy in the program who's had, I think he just had 200 placements. That's what I love about this is I love seeing the people who are going through it starting to really, you know, get a lot of traction with their songs in a way that was never available to them a year ago. Michael, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. This was great. I appreciate it. Don't forget to check out our affiliates, including Lab Canna, fine hemp products since 2014. Click on their link on our website for more information and how to order their product line. Click on our website link to get a free digital copy of Larry Butler's new rulebook 
for singers and songwriters. 101 ways to help improve your chances of success. Also, check out our other affiliate, Music Starts Here. You can find them at musicstartshere.org. Probably the best one-stop shop for the singer, songwriter, or aspiring musician who's relocating to Nashville or wants to. Last but not least, shameless plug for this podcast. Become a YouTube subscriber by going to the Business Side of Music page. You can hear all of our released episodes there. Also, check out our website at businesssideofmusic.com. Follow us on Facebook at the Business Side of Music podcast and on Twitter at Biz Side of Music. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Fusan.